This, this is Saurabh, and, and you're listening, listening to my, my favorite, favorite talk show, show the, the, the VG show, show with Aditya. For millennia, humans have loved watching other humans perform in a fictional manner, which over the years has become part of the entertainment. So whether it was watching just act out play to show what their interpretation is, humans have loved watching such kind of things. And over the years, over the past century, theatres have given way to more passive form of medium that is in theatres the watchers the audience used to be involved in the play even if we know that everything that was being performed was fictional it was exaggeration was a figment of the imagination of the actors directors writers involved in the play which gave way to watching on a more passive medium that is the electronic devices that is the TV, the computers and others. But one thing that didn't change was the involvement of the people in watching the play means the passive audience. They are to this day, despite their perceived intelligence and maturity, still influenced by the content of the play. Just as the idea of nation is an artificial construct, the idea of culture is also an artificial construct, yet we get influenced by these things and if we feel that the certain play is not presenting the facts accurately, representing one's mythology accurately, we tend to get burned up. We tend to say that it is insulting our culture and we want to stop the play and this is one thing which human beings need to change we should know that it's fictional there is no target it's all in the imagination of the creators of that particular play or tv show so do we need to regulate it in a way no when it's fictional why do we need to imagine that there is violence or vulgar content in the show when it's clear that it's a form of entertainment the actors are paid to do that particular role. They have no involvement. They do the role, they finish the contract and they move on. So should there be some residue left while the passive watchers get influenced that the content should be regulated because when says young minds, well, what do we mean by young minds? We are ourselves controlling young minds that a three-year-old should not watch an action movie because they don't understand it. Well, we should allow everyone to watch everything. Yet, human beings by design and default are gullible and malleable. We get so influenced by the content. We think that it's all real. And if the said show or the play a certain era or shows content which is perceived to be bad for people's minds. We want to regulate it, put a stop to it or as the modern terminology is censor it. I think there is no logic because it's fictional. Let's understand what does one mean by the term vulgar and violence. It does amuse me when we get the excuse of vulgar and violence for not watching a certain form of entertainment, whether it's movies, TV shows, plays, or even books. We come up with this excuse that a certain program, whether it's on TV, movies, plays, or any form of literature, a particular dialogue, a particular scene is perceived as insulting to one's culture. What culture? There is no concept of culture. Culture is an artificial construct so that humans feel that they are all together when we know everyone is for themselves and if this idea of saying that don't watch this or we will cut some content from this particular book or tv show or something well it will dilute and corrode the 
the originality of the content if people are hurt then they better start resetting themselves at what is meant by the definition of hurt and then there are some fringe groups all over the world who have nothing better to do than say that this particular content hurts us or this particular dialogue from this movie or tv show hurts our sentiments let me tell you it doesn't hurt for these fringe groups whose members cannot contribute 1% to the original content or something worthwhile all they can do is say that it hurts our sentiments because that's the only recurring repeatable dialogue they can come up with and after a while it becomes boring nobody wants to hear eventually these fringe groups have no loci no standing so should content be regulated it's digital cable networks or any other cable networks even if it is a parody or a mockery of certain individuals or certain events well let it be if we do get influence or hurt by the certain mockery attempt of certain individuals or certain events in history then we are gullible and malleable that we have so much time that we are hurt we should just watch it and move on so the logic of regulation doesn't even come into the picture a hypothesis has been created that if we watch such content we will be influenced by it our minds are so porous and gullible and malleable that we will behave like the characters the fictional imagined characters of the set play tv show movie etc then we are fools if we have so much time that certain attempts will influence us and we will become like them then we are weak human beings are always weak they are easily malleable gullible and moldable its extremities when they show certain events being mocked we feel bad but when they show certain events being exaggerated especially in the idea of the patriotic side of things assume that showing certain patriotic elements in movies tv shows means that the real life of what they represent will be influenced they will feel motivated just like culture the idea of patriotism nationalism is also an artificial construct it should be left to only movies where they can exaggerate as much as they want but in real life the what is real life and what is fiction is now becoming blurred nobody knows what is fiction what is real what is mockery and what is parody and what is fiction and what we read or see is just a representation of our own minds well the blurring has caused us to behave in a manner where we feel that certain things disrespect our culture when culture itself is an artificial idea created so that humans can perceive to live in the perceived idea of harmony so while one school of thought says that the content should be balanced so that there is no need for a regulation and watch dogs and for pseudo groups to come and say that we are going to cut content the other school of thought says that censorship curbs the idea of content creators experimenting with the medium it's a universal truth that whether there is regulation or no regulation or perceived regulation because there is a feeling that the content often crosses a line we have to understand what line it is we would be gullible if we get influenced by that line crossing it's a simple understanding you don't like what you are watching just skip that particular scene or particular dialogue in the program or particular content and move on or move on to another tv show but this whole idea of regulation is hogwash a corrosive move and a bad move by whoever has proposed this move because certain fringe groups have nothing to contribute as far as the idea of content originality and anything worthwhile is concerned especially in the name of pseudo culture
ए भाई सर देख के चलो आगे ही नहीं पीछे भी दाए ही नहीं बाए भी आया है वो तेरा घर नहीं गली नहीं गांव नहीं कुंच नहीं बस नहीं रस नहीं दुनिया है और प्यारे दुनिया ये सर्कस है और सर्कस में बड़े को भी छोटे को भी खड़े को भी खोटे को भी दुबले को भी मोटे को भी नीचे से ऊपर को ऊपर से नीचे को आना जाना पड़ता है और रिंग मास्टर के कोड़े पर कोड़ा जो बुका है पैसा है कोड़ा जो किस्मत है तरह तरह नाच के दिखाना यहाँ पड़ता है बार बार रोना और गाना यहाँ पड़ता है हीरो से जोकर बन जाना पड़ता है हे भाई गिरने से डरता है क्यों मरने से डरता है क्यों ठोकर तो जब तक नहीं खाएगा गम को ना जब तक बुलाएगा जिंदगी है चीज क्या नहीं जान पाएगा रोता हुआ आया है रोता हुआ जाएगा हे भाई क्या है करिश्मा कैसा खिलवाड़ है जानवर आदमी से ज्यादा वफादार है खाता है कोड़ा भी रहता है भूखा भी मालिक पे करता नहीं वार है और इंसान ये माल जिसका खाता है प्यार जिससे पाता है गीत जिसके गाता है उसकी ही सीने में भूम कटा कटार है ए भाई हाँ बाबू ये सर्कस है तीन घंटे का पहला घंटा बचपन है दूसरा जवानी है तीसरा बुढ़ापा है मैं नहीं बाप नहीं बेटा नहीं बेटी नहीं तू नहीं मैं नहीं ये नहीं वो नहीं कुछ भी नहीं रहता है रहता है जो कुछ वो खाली खाली कुर्सियां हैं खाली खाली तंबू है खाली खाली घेड़ा है बिना चिड़िया के बसेरा है न तेरा है न मेरा है घातक रिश्ते चैप्टर वन पार्ट सिक्स हर्क्यूल पोरो सिटिंग इन फ्रंट ऑफ इस इलेक्ट्रिक रेडिएटर एंड फीलिंग अ क्वाइट सेटिस्फेक्शन इन इट्स नीट जियोमेट्रिकल पैटर्न वाज गिविंग इंस्ट्रक्शंस टू इस वैले एंड जनरल फैक्टोटम यू अंडरस्टैंड जॉर्जेस परफेक्टली सर मोर प्रोबेबली अ फ्लैट � and it will definitely be within certain limits. South of the park, east of Kensington Church, west of Knights Bridge Barracks, and north of Fulham Road. I understand perfectly, sir. Pirate murmur, a curious little case. There is evidence here of a very definite talent for organization, and there is, of course, the surprising invisibility of the star performer, the Nemean lion himself, if I may so style him. Yes, an interesting little case. I could wish that I felt more attracted to my client, but he bears an unfortunate resemblance to a soap manufacturer of Leeds who poisoned his wife in order to marry a blonde secretary. One of my early successes. Georges shook his head. He said gravely, These blondes, sir, they are responsible for a lot of trouble. Three days later, when the invaluable Georges said, This is the address, sir, Hercule Poirot took the piece of paper handed to him. Excellent, my good Georges, and what day of the week? Thursdays, sir, Thursdays, and today most fortunately is a Thursday, so there need be no delay. Twenty minutes later, Hercule Poirot was climbing the stairs of an obscure block of flats tucked away in a little street leading off a more fashionable one. No, ten Rossum Mansion was on the third and top floor and there was no lift. Poirot toiled upwards round and round the narrow corkscrew staircase. He paused to regain his breath on the top landing and from behind the door number 10 a new sound broke the silence. The sharp bark of a dog. Hercule Poirot nodded his head with a slight smile. He pressed the bell of number 10, the barking redoubled. Footsteps came to the door. It was opened. Miss 
Amy Carnaby fell back. Her head went to her ample breast. You permit that I enter, said Hercule Poirot, and entered without waiting for the reply. It was a sitting room, door open on the right, and he walked in. Behind him, Miss Carnaby followed as though in a dream. The room was very small and much overcrowded. Amongst the furniture, a human being could be discovered, an elderly woman lying on a sofa drawn up to the gas fire. As Poirot came in, a Pekingese dog jumped off the sofa and came forward uttering a few sharp, suspicious barks. Went forward extending his hand. The dog sniffed at it, his intelligent eyes fixed on the man's face. Miss Carnaby muttered faintly, so you know. P.G. Woodhouse Chapter 18 The first thing that impressed itself on the senses was that he had about as spectacular a black eye as you could meet with in a month of Sundays and I found myself at the momentary loss to decide how it was best to react to it. I mean, some fellows with bunged up eyes want sympathy. Others prefer that you pretend that you have noticed nothing unusual in their appearance. I came to the conclusion that it was wisest to greet him with a careless ass food, and I did so. Though I suppose, looking back, ah, that fit cut would have been more suitable, and it was, as I spoke, that I became aware that he was glaring at me in a sinister manner with the eye that wasn't closed. I have spoken of these eyes of his as being capable of opening an oyster at 60 paces, and even when only one of them is functioning, the impact of his gaze was disquieting. I have known my aunt Agatha's gaze to affect me in the same way. I was looking for you, Wooster, he said. He had uttered the words in the unpleasant, rasping voice, which had once kept his followers on the jump. For succeeding to his new title, he had been one of those dictators who were fairly common at one time in the metropolis and had gone about with a mob of underlinings wearing black shorts and shouting hail spood or words along those general lines. It up when he became Lord Sidcup, but he was still apt to address all and sundry as if he were taking off some erring member of his entourage whose shots had got a patch on them. Who oh, were you? I said. I was. He paused for a moment, continuing to give me the eye. Then he said, So, who so is another of those things, like you and her? which it's never easy to find the right answer to. Nothing in the way of a comeback suggested itself to me, though so I merely lit a cigarette in what I intended to be a nonchalant manner, though I may have missed it by a considerable margin, and he proceeded. So I was right, huh? In my suspicions, huh? They have been confirmed. Huh? Stop saying her, huh, you miserable little worm, and listen to me. I humored him. You might have supposed that having so recently seen him knock base over Apex by the Reverend H.P. Pinker and subsequently laid out cold by Emerald Stoker and a basin of beans, I would have regarded him with contempt as pretty small time stuff rebuked him sharply for calling me a miserable worm, but the idea never so much as crossed my mind. He had suffered reverses, too, but they had left him with his spirit unbroken and the muscles of his brawny arms 
just as much like iron bands at the head always been and the way i look at it it was as if he wanted me to go easy on the word or he had only to say so for more awesome content tune into the next episode of the weekly show with aditya for more awesome content tune into the next episode of the weekly show with aditya